start. Good afternoon. You're all very welcome to this third session of the seminar series Status Check, 20 years of the Equal Status Act, which FLAC is running in association with Trinity Law School. I believe there's a second Trinity Law School conference happening at the same time, but we have 350 people registered, which is absolutely fantastic and I think shows a huge interest in, in this event. Today's topic is Ireland's evolving equality architecture. I'm Eilish Sparry from FLAC, and I'd like to start by saying a few words about the equality infrastructure from an access to justice perspective. There is a striking synergy or interconnectedness between how we in FLAC define access to justice and the necessity and rationale for having a distinct equality infrastructure. In FLAC's view, access to justice includes a continuum, beginning with access to legal information, then legal advice, then legal representation, but it also includes access to effective remedies and law reform. And all of these very much correlate to the powers and functions that specialized bodies like IRAC have. It is these perceived barriers to access to, ju to justice, which has led to a number of EU directives requiring member states to establish specialized bodies, which must have specified functions and powers to promote equality and include providing assistance to victims of discrimination. These EU directives also have a very strong focus on effective remedies, which is a key part of access to justice. Looking at the context and the background from an overarching context, context there is the equality guarantee in the constitution but it has not been a significant source of protection for the groups that come within the discriminatory grounds in the equality legislation, such as travelers, people with disabilities, members of the LGBTIQ plus community. Constitutional rights are often considered in this context to see whether they can be used to defeat rather than enhance or support equality claims. And the courts have regularly subordinated the equality uh, guarantee to other rights in the constitution such as property rights, which were which trumped disability rights in the reference to the Supreme Court of the Equality Legislation and freedom of association trumped gender equality in the Port Marnock Golf Club case. On a side note, while the Citizens Assembly on, general, on Gender Equality recently recommended the insertion of a new clause into Article 40 to explicitly refer to gender equality and non-discrimination, I think if this is to happen, it would be important to consider including the other grounds of discrimination named in the equality legislation as well. Related to the poor interpretation of the equality guarantee in constitutional equality claims is what happens when discrimination claims under the Equal Status Act are heard in the superior courts. You may start out with a very strong determination and a good and reasoned outcome before the Workplace Relations Commission in a legislative equality claim, but it is extremely difficult to succeed in any kind of equality claim once these claim claims end up being adjudicated on in the superior courts, as is illustrated by the recent and very worrying judgment of the High Court on the issue of access to driving licenses for asylum seekers, where the High Court effectively, and in my view, incorrectly expanded greatly the already overbroad exem exemption given to the state under Section 14 of the Equal Status Act. And it is great that IRIC supported this important case so far. The EU, EU directives, uh, anti-discrimination directives, while far from perfect, have been a far greater source of protection in the area of anti-discrimination. Judy Walsh, in the first seminar, uh, referenced the recent case of the Court of Justice on age discrimination, which held that the Workplace Relations Commission can disapply national legislation if it conflicts with EU law. That case went on so long, I think both the Equality Authority and IREC were involved in supporting it. Now, if I understand Judy correctly from the first session, it may be possible on the basis of this uh, judgment of the Court of Justice, for example, to refer a claim to the Workplace Relations Commission under the Equal Status Act and assert that the criminal trespass legislation may be incompatible with the race directive. 
or ask the Workplace Relations Commission to interpret the equal status legislation in such a way as to bring on Garda Siakona within its prohibition on discrimination. This judgment makes the Workplace Relations Commission an even more important key part of the equality infrastructure. Though we, we have seen on the first day of these seminars that there are challenges in bringing claims to the Workplace Relations Commission, such as the inaccessible form for referring complaints under the Equal Status Act and the two month written notification requirement. Another part of the infrastructure was that the equality legislation requires investigations of equality claims to be in private. This was an important and valuable feature of the legislation in claims which involve highly personal, intimate and sensitive matters, and in many instances may have been a decisive feature as to whether a claim would proceed or not. However, the recent Supreme Court judgment in Zaluski, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which is problematic for a number of other reasons, has perhaps added some additional barriers in that equality claims must now be heard in public and the possibility of retaining anonymity has been lost. Another important factor in considering the infrastructure is that the annual reports of the Workplace Relations Commission show that the number of claims being brought under the workplace, to the Workplace Commission under the Equal Status Act are reducing. This worrying fact, together with the weakness of the equality guarantee, the difficulties in bringing claims before the superior courts, the enormous potential and challenges of bringing claims before the Workplace Relations Commission all point to the need for supports in bringing such claims. So what supports are there? A recent report on the absence of legal aid for employment equality claims in Ireland by LLM students in TCD showed that claimants lost over 75% of the cases brought before the WRC before January 2019 and the 31st of January 2021. From January 2018 to the end of January 2021, claimants with professional representation won more than 30% of the cases, and claimants with union representation won 32.6% of their cases. But for those claimants without representation, there was a staggering loss rate of more than 86% before the Workplace Relations Commission. And I'd be very surprised if the figures in relation to uh, claims under the Equal Status Act were not the same or indeed worse. Given th those figures, at the same time, it's important to point out that there is no statutory entitlement to legal aid for the majority of claims under the equality legislation. No matter how complex the issue is, no matter how little resources the claimant may have, no matter how much resources the respondent may have, and no matter how important the issue may be for the claimant, bearing in mind that equal status claims may relate to important issues like housing and education. While it is open to the Minister for Justice and Equality to extend the legal aid scheme to the Workplace Relations Commission and the Social Welfare Appeals Office by way of statutory instrument, that has not happened the, despite the UN Surge Committee making such a recommendation and despite the very strong provisions in the EU, EU Charter on uh, legal aid. While the Legal Aid Board is able to provide legal aid and discrimination claims against licensed premises in the district court, this is rarely provided. And it is possible to obtain legal aid in respect of an appeal under the Equal Status Act to, this, to the circuit court or in a gender discrimination claim which commences in the circuit court. It is also possible to get legal advice and discrimination claims from the Legal Aid Board, but again, we're not aware of any of that happening to any significant extent. FLAC operates a clinic for the Roma community and has established a Traveller Legal Services, which operates with one legal solicitor. We know from these services and from our telephone information line and from our work with our UCC partners in the Traveller Equality Law and Justice Project and our partners in ENAR, the significant unmet legal need in the area of discrimination claims, which our services just cannot meet. We also operate a pro bono referral scheme through PILA, and we know how difficult it is to get private practitioners to take on individual discrimination claims on a pro bono basis. 
Due to limited resources, we in FLAC and the Traveller Legal Service try to engage in what we call strategic litigation and take on cases that may have an impact beyond the individual. I know when I worked in the Equality Authority that we try to do that as well. And I understand that IRIC also has a strategic litigation strategy. But this can be problematic. It can be very uncomfortable telling someone that their claim has no added strategic value. And when very little lit litigation is carried out in a particular area, for example, in relation to Roma or traveller rights, every case has the potential to be strategic. So how do you distinguish? There are other problems with strategic litigation. Good claims will inevitably settle and the state or local authorities may impose very strict confidentiality clauses, which reduces the strategic benefit of, benefit of taking the claims and allows the state and our local authorities to continue on as before, which is why the Bill on Non-Disclosures Agreement is so interesting and important. It is also why the power of IREC to inst institute proceedings is in its own name is so unique and important as it would be under no pressure or need to settle. My memory is that the Equality Authority used this power twice in instituting a discriminatory advertising claim against Ryanair and also proceedings against Port Marna uh, Golf Club. From FLAC's perspective, a specialized equality body instituting proceedings in its own name has a significant potential to achieve an effective remedy which cannot be compromised or, in, or ignored. Another issue with the lack of civil legal aid is that if you only bring strategic cases, it is likely that there will not be a sufficient body of case law to establish a culture of compliance so that potential respondents think it is unlikely that a case will be taken against them if they don't comply with the law. And the law then goes largely unenforced. At various times, Ireland has been regarded as a leader in terms of equality protection. At one stage, Ireland was at the forefront of Europe in terms of protection against sexual harassment, which was due at least partly to the organised specialised body, the original specialised equality body, the Employment Equality Agency, taking cases to the Labour Court, which established groundbreaking, groundbreaking case law. And I'm old enough to remember Evelyn Owen in the uh, Labour Court and Sylvia, Sylvia Meehan in the Employment Equality Agency championing these cases. There was significant concern when the Employment Equality Agency changed into the Equality Authority and the discrimination grounds increased to nine grounds of discrimination that gender would lose out in a multi-grant situation. Now the scope at that stage also moved beyond employment to the provision of goods and services, accommodation and education. And again, Ireland was perceived to be at the head of Europe in terms of equality protection. Equally, when the Equality Authority was brought within IREC, there was a concern that equality or anti-discrimination would lose out to more traditional and familiar human rights. And this came at a time when the equality infrastructure was being dismantled and after severe cuts to the Equality Authority budget. It is clear that there are potentials and challenges in all of these arrangements, as I think is highlighted by the last important part of the infrastructure worth mentioning, which is the unique public sector equality and human rights duty introduced by section 42 of the 2014 Act, which imposes an obligation on all state and public bodies to have regard to the need to promote equality and human rights in all of their functions. And this should put uh, the mainstream the mainstreaming of equality at the heart of policy making. Finally, the programme for government commits to expanding the discriminatory grounds to include uh, socioeconomic status. We have seen from this seminar and the interest in it that there seems to be a growing appetite to put Ireland at the forefront in terms of anti-discrimination. And I look forward to hearing now from our speakers about how, that, how best that can be achieved. We'll now move to Neil Crowley, who's an independent equality and human rights consultant. He's worked with the Council of Europe and the European Commission in a range of jurisdictions, as, as well as Equinet, the European Network of Equality Bodies. He's co-founder of Values Lab, and more recently his work has focused on supporting a values-led implementation of the public sector equality and human rights duty. Prior to that, he was uh, CEO of the Equality Authority, and before that, he was in, with Pave Point. He is uh, the author of a number of books, including An Ambition for Quality and Empty Promises, Bringing the Equality Authority to Heal, 
but more recently he's engaged in fiction and uh, short stories. It was a great pleasure and privilege uh, for me to work uh, with Neil in the Equality Authority and looking back on it, uh, we had a lot of fun at that stage. I'll hand you over to Neil now. Thanks very much, Eilish. Um, and while you might be old enough to remember Sylvia Meehan and Evelyn Owen and the work that they did, I'm equally old enough to remember Eilish Barry and the work, great work she did in the Ryanair case and the Port Marnock golf, golf Club case that, that you mentioned, which were hugely important, both in terms of, of litigation, but also in terms of national debate on, on, on these issues. So great to be with you again, Eilish. Turning then to the <clears throat> topic of, of, the, of the day, the equality architecture, I'd start by saying in the field of equality policy, I think we're all too accustomed to the ambition and policy made not being matched by the ambition and policy actually being implemented. It's a significant gap as positive policy developments end up making little impact on the situation of those experiencing inequality. Equality legislation stands out for having a different potential in this regard with its provisions for a dedicated equality architecture. This equality architecture has a potential not only to drive implementation of equality legislation, but also to champion the societal standards inherent in such legislation and to underpin the ambition it reflects for achieving change in the situation and experience of groups subject to inequality. Our equality architecture has evolved from a single mandate equality authority and equality tribunal to the current arrangement of a multi-mandate Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission and Workplace Relations Commission. In this presentation, I'm going to draw from a number of key European level documents, which I think provide an overarching frame for examination of this equality architecture that goes beyond the previous singular concern with independence in addressing equality bodies through, I think, a more useful frame that encompasses independence alongside effectiveness and accessibility. And this frame has recently been established in the standards adopted for equality bodies at European level by the Council of Europe in 2017 and the European Commission in 2019. Going back a bit before that though, a 2010 study of equality bodies commissioned by the European Commission valuably concluded that equality bodies were necessary and valuable institutions for social change. It established that equality bodies were challenged to function with such an ambition if they are to respond adequately to the scale of discrimination, of underreporting of discrimination and of inequality in society. Equinet, in its 2013 publication on indicators to measure the impact of equality bodies, established three levels of social change to be pursued by equality bodies. There was the individual level, impacting on the situation and experience of people subjected to discrimination, which is achieved through equality body litigation and provision of information, advice, and legal support. There's the institutional level, impacting on organizational systems of employers and service providers, and on policy-making systems of public authorities to better realize equality outcomes, which is achieved through equality body litigation, policy advice, and promotion of good practice models. And then finally, at the societal level, impacting on public attitudes and public discourse to secure a public valuing of equality and diversity, which is achieved through equality body communications that engage values of dignity and inclusion in public discourse and research that builds a necessary knowledge base. And I suppose this focus on social change provided an early frame through which to view, understand, and assess the potential and achievement of equality bodies. Equinet has put this frame to sustained use in extracting learning from the work of equality bodies and in enabling peer support between equality bodies. However, it's not clear that any such reflective mode or even evaluation has evolved at national level in equality bodies to review, learn from, and evolve their work. The review of equality bodies published in 2018 by the European Commission identified that only 10 out of the 43 equality body bodies reviewed had engaged in any form of evaluation. Turning then to the standards, the Council of Europe and the European Commission standards for equality bodies. These are concerned with the conditions for independence, effectiveness and accessibility created for equality bodies by the national authorities. And by the conditions created by the equality bodies themselves for this independence, effectiveness, and accessibility. These standards have further evolved the frame through which we can review and assess the potential of and challenges to our equality architecture. And I'm gonna pick up three themes in this presentation from this frame that seem to me to present challenges for all of us here in the Irish context. 
themes of multi-mandate bodies, of litigation and enforcement, and of engagement with civil society. With regard to the first area of challenge, the benchmarking review of 2018, which provided the benchmark for the European Commission and the Council of Europe standards for equality bodies, identified the establishment of multi-mandate bodies as an emerging trend, finding 14 equality bodies from the 43 reviewed that were multi-mandate bodies, including here in Ireland. These multi-mandate bodies had an equality mandate alongside other mandates, such as a human rights mandate or, or and uh, an ombudsperson mandate. The European Commission standard reflects a concern in this development in recommending that multi-mandate bodies have an internal infrastructure uh, to ensure focus on their equality mandate. The Council of Mandate Standard, Council of Europe, sorry, uh, standard identifies that there are challenges for multi-mandate bodies, given that each mandate comes with its own tradition, its own approach and its own objectives. It emphasized that multi-mandate settings for equality bodies should only be pursued where this does not weaken the equality mandate. And it recommended action by multi-mandate bodies to establish governance and management structures that ensure leadership for and visibility of this equality mandate and to allocate appropriate human and financial resources for its implementation. By way of an aside, this standard notes the importance of featuring equality in the actual name of the multi-mandate body, a message of some importance for our Workplace Relations Commission whose name provides no hint of its equality mandate, particularly when it comes to the Equal Status Acts. The experience of multi-mandate bodies across Europe is that the human rights mandate ends up dominating the equality mandate in terms of visibility and in terms of investment of resources. The equality mandate gets reduced to a concern for non-discrimination, a focus it shares with the human rights mandate, rather than a more ambitious focus on the achievement of full equality in practice to use the language of the EU Equal Treatment Directives. The 2018 Review of Equality Bodies identified the need for an active engagement of the equality mandate in multi-mandate bodies to address these concerns. It found no such active management in seven out of the 14 multi-mandate bodies identified, including Ireland. Issues of lack of visibility for the equality mandate or limited use of the equality mandate competences are found in these bodies as a result. The good practices in the active management of different mandates by multi-mandate bodies identified in this 2018 review included a specific leadership and governance structure for the equality mandate established within the body, a separate staff unit and dedicated budgetary resources to implement the equality mandate, in particular its work on litigation, and specific steps to ensure a public visibility for the equality mandate itself. Such approaches are silo-based and therefore are limited in achieving actual gains from the multi-mandate context for the equality mandate. However, such a silo-based approach is a vital safeguard for the equality mandate in the absence of any thinking on or models for how to effectively integrate the human rights mandate with the equality mandate to the mutual gain of each of them. Models for an integration of these mandates demand our urgent attention and, and development, both in Ireland and beyond, if such bodies are to be effective in implementing their equality mandate. In the absence of such models, specific leadership and human and financial resources for the equality mandate are required in these bodies. Turning then to the second area of challenge, litigation. The standards emphasize the central importance of this litigation function of equality bodies for the full implementation of equality legislation. The European Commission standard has a dedicated section on independent assistance to victims of discrimination. The Council of Europe standard identifies and sets standards in relation to a specific support and litigation function for equality bodies. This support and litigation function is vital in a context where there are so few other actors in place with the resources and standing to play such a role. There's a concern noted in the 2018 review at inadequate levels of support and litigation by equality bodies. The review identified 17 equality bodies out of the 43 reviewed, being hampered in such work by limited competences to implement this function and 25 equality bodies being hampered by the tension inherent in their mandates, combining both the casework decision-making function with the support and litigation function. Alongside this, the review identified a further eight equality bodies, including in Ireland, that had not used their support and litigation powers to a significant extent. Limited litigation is often justified by equality bodies in terms of the imperative to engage in strategic litigation, using the resources available to generate the case law that gives new clarity to legislative provisions. 
However, while this is important, the Council of Europe standard emphasizes that strategic litigation should also include for the critical mass of casework to be pursued on each of the different grounds covered at a level sufficient to motivate employers and service providers to respect their obligations. This focus on a critical mass of litigation by equality bodies is key to the social change purpose of equality bodies. It builds confidence across the grounds in the legislation as a means of challenging experiences of discrimination. It supports a culture of compliance among employers and service providers that stimulates respect for the legislation and their policies, procedures and practices. And Eilish made reference to that. It underpins a public discourse supportive of action for equality and against discrimination through the publicity surrounding this case. An accessible venue for hearing and deciding on cases under the equality legislation is also important in ensuring a critical mass of casework. The Workplace Relations Commission is increasingly challenged to live up to such a standard. In such a context, the flat proposal for a statutory entitlement to legal aid to be implemented for claims under the equality legislation becomes an absolute imperative. The third and final area of challenge I will address relates to civil society. <clears throat> the European Commission standard recommends that member states should enable equality bodies to cooperate with civil society. The Council of Europe standard recommends that equality bodies build a continuous dialogue with groups experiencing discrimination and intolerance and their representative organizations and organizations working more generally on equality and human rights issues. This is essentially a new form of mutual education in that the equality body is made aware of the issues facing these groups and these groups are made aware of the support available from and the work of the equality body. But the Council of Europe standard goes further in recommending that equality bodies should put in place structures for sustained involvement and contribution of stakeholders, in particular civil society organizations, in the planning and work of the equality body itself. It notes that a valuable tool for this is the establishment of an advisor committee with a membership drawn from these organizations. The 2018 review identified that formal stakeholder engagement was evident in only 12 of the 43 equality bodies reviewed. This engagement took a range of forms, including joint initiatives by equality bodies with stakeholders, the use of stakeholder engagement as a working method for equality bodies, and equality bodies acting as a hub around which stakeholders are engaged. The review identified that this lack of stakeholder involvement is sometimes argued by equality bodies as serving to protect their independence, noting, however, that this interpretation of independence impedes effectiveness. The independence of equality bodies, however, can't be seen in terms of creating some form of hallowed separate space free from such engagement with stakeholders. Rather, it should be seen as shaping the approach of the equality body to stakeholders and managing the relationships required to be effective in this. In conclusion, I would add that this debate on independence, effectiveness and accessibility of equality bodies poses specific challenges to civil society. Civil society came into its own in this regard with the demise of the Equality Authority in 2008. In organizing to defend the equality architecture at a moment of crisis, a unique coalition, the Equality and Rights Alliance was formed. Over subsequent years, the Equality and Rights Alliance moved from defending an equality architecture under attack uh, to putting forward a roadmap for its, for its re restoration and evolution. With the establishment of IREC and the Workplace Relations Commission, it moved to a role of monitoring standards for their independent, effective and accessible operation, acting as a supportive watchdog on the equality architecture. This civil society contribution, however, has diminished with the demise of the Equality and Rights Alliance due to lack of funding in 2019. If we want an independent, effective and accessible equality architecture, we need to re-establish such a coalition, investing in its role of generating new thinking for the design and functioning of this multi-mandate equality architecture, and in monitoring its operations and impact against European standards. These standards pose challenges, offer a valuable focus for debate and invention, and should underpin a further strengthening of our equality infrastructure and how it operates. It's important that they get the attention they deserve and in particular in any forthcoming review and revision of the equality legislation. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Neil. Um, we'll now move to uh, Chief Commissioner Sinead Gibney, who leads the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission in its mission to build a just and inclusive uh, a society that protects and promotes human rights and equality. She is driven by equality, people's inherent dignity, and a passion to make society work for those among us with the most acute and complex needs. 
Sinead was the inaugural director of the commission, bringing together the former legacy bodies in the merger period and building up the organization in terms of teams, facilities, planning and structure. Prior to this, she built and led Google Ireland's corporate social responsibility function, social action. Sinead. Thanks so much, uh, Eilish, and uh, thanks to you both for, for your contributions. Um, I think the series is such a well-timed and, and very welcome uh, series of seminars from FLAC, so thank you for running it. I think it's just such an important moment for us all who occupy this space uh, uh, within equality law to reflect on the, uh, the legislation um, and to really mark uh, our vision for, for what it should look like going, uh, going forward. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, IREC as an institution, as an equality body, um, and as part of the equality law infrastructure that we're focusing on today, as well as drilling down then into some of our specific powers. I'll touch briefly on the WRC and civil society as the other speakers have, and then I want to make some broader comments on the wider equality legislation picture. Uh, looking forward to what can be improved, knowing obviously that the, the minister has committed to this equality uh, legislation review, and then commenting also on, on the wider policy context, and, and Neil has referenced some of that already, um, because obviously any such review needs to be considered uh, within that. Um, Ireland's current equality legislation is, for the most part, a floor below which we agree to not fall, if you like. So it's not so much that it speaks uh, to the better angels of our nature, but perhaps to curb the, the, the more baser human instincts uh, like prejudice and bias. And that's not to detract from the fact that both of the acts, the Equal Employment Equality Act and the Equal Status Act, were viewed at their time of initiation as quite radical when they were first introduced and still have the potential to be liberally interpreted by the courts. Um, but what then is the role of the rest of the equality architecture, the institutions which uphold equality and champion it, like ourselves in IREC, um, or those where the rights can be vindicated, such as the courts or the WRC? It's seven years uh, since the Equality Authority and the Irish Human Rights Commission were formally merged. Um, and although a new organization with our own legislation was established, we didn't emerge from a blank slate. The Equality Authority had existed for 15 years and the IHRC for 14 years prior to the merger. So although we carry, um, although we have our own uh, identity as that merged institution, I like to think that we carry the legacy of both of those bodies with us. So I describe us really as a, as a 20 year old institution, if you like. But it's important to um, talk about that merger and talk about what that means in terms of uh, advantages and challenges uh, of carrying that merged institution, that merged statutory mandate of equality and human rights, and obviously Neil has alluded to some of this already. Um, this integrated approach where the function of IREC um, is, as you've heard, to protect and promote human rights and equality, to encourage the development of a culture of respect for human rights, equality and intercultural understanding, and to promote understanding and awareness of the importance of human rights and equality in the state. And it carries with it that advantage of the combination of human rights and equality and progressing uh, within both. So for example, within our legal work, it allows the construction of cases where both human rights and equality violations have occurred. Um, and it allows for a more expansive approach to challenging discrimination, moving beyond the limitations of the existing grounds um, or the need to have the, an exact comparator. And I know that was touched upon in, in the first of this series. So for example, IREC, um, and we've already heard mention of this case, IREC has challenged uh, discriminatory regulations which preclude asylum seekers from applying for a driver license, both at the WRC um, and also through the use of our amicus curiae role in the High Court, where the issue is being argued through the prism of constitutional law, the European Convention on Human Rights and EU law. Similarly, our amicus intervention in the Nano Nagel case, uh, which was an employment case uh, dealing with reasonable accommodation that drew on the UN CRPD in the interpretation of the EU employment framework directive. So we see that combination coming through in those examples. And of course, as a merged institution, we retain certain functions of the legacy institutions. And I want to just run through at a very high level uh, some of those as they relate to uh, equality. So we have the provision of information to the public about their rights under equality legislation. 
We provide legal assistance uh, granted to individuals under Section 40. And as Eilish referenced, this is where we believe there is a strategic public interest in that case. And most of those cases in practice have been granted in cases dealing with discrimination. We've undertaken uh, significant national public awareness campaigns, most recently promoting the rights of people with disabilities um, and challenging racism. And that's a space that's notable for the absence of other public bodies. We've sought to progress longer term structural change through engagement with some central government agencies like Deeper and the CSO on equality budgeting and equality data, and we have seen some gains in that area. We've used our research function to gather evidence on discrimination, uh, both established discrimination and some of the more emerging patterns that we see. We've worked closely with public bodies um, to look at the implementation, implementation of the public sector equality and human rights duty. And I'm going to go into a bit more depth in, in the duty um, shortly. And as mentioned by Judy Walsh in the first of these sessions, we've exercised our power to initiate equality reviews in a number of sectors, including um, access to public housing for non-EEA nationals, access to interpreters for people accessing medical card services, traveler accommodation services by local authorities, access to bank accounts for asylum seekers, the supervision of urine testing for drug users. Uh, and uh, some of these are still ongoing. Um, and those that have been completed though have seen great results. So uh, for example, in the treatment of drug users by HSE run methadone services, um, and more recently, a very public declaration by all of Ireland's retail banks that they will now accept asylum seekers state issued documents in applications to open an account and that was on foot of our quality review engagement. So we also have powers which we have not yet used um, and, in, and that includes the power to initiate an inquiry where there's evidence of serious violation of human rights or equality and it's important that that does connect to both human rights and equality um, and there's no question that there are issues here when it comes to that section of our legislation. And some of the other challenges, real or perceived, um, I'd like to address now of merging a na national equality body and a national human rights institution. They are different traditions, as Neil mentioned. They are compatible, though, and I believe they are complementary. Sometimes they're loosely categorized as referencing or as referring to individual rights versus the rights of the collective. But arguably, human rights does include collective rights, the so-called third generation of rights, for example, to healthy environment, cultural heritage. Those can only be realized as a group. Um, and IREC fo focuses on the indivisibility of rights in all of our reporting areas, in our amicus curiae work, in our legislative um, review. Uh, but since our establishments, and I've just rec re referenced one of them, we have identified ways in which our legislation could be strengthened and reformed to, to be more effective in the use of our powers. And that is something we will continue uh, to keep under review. It's also worth noting that as Ireland's national equality body, despite being the sum of two institutions, IREC is now only as large as the Equality Authority with its single mandate was before the crash of, of 2008. And also while general awareness of IREC as a new institution uh, among the public is improving and we have data to back that up, we do have to ask ourselves why the Citizens Assembly recently saw fit to make a recommendation to establish a new body specifically tasked with uh, tackling gender inequality. And in that recommendation, it referenced a very broad mandate. It cited the broad mandate of IREC as part of its rationale, but yet this is precisely the core function uh, of a national equality body. So those are some of the um, kind of, I suppose, opportunities and challenges that we see as emerged institutions. So I want to touch now on the remaining elements of the equality architecture, which are the WRC and, and civil society as we see them. So when it comes to institutions which facilitate the vindication of equality rights, uh, obviously the, the Workplace Relations Commission is, is a critical part of that. And Neil also already referenced this, but I just want to touch on it as well, because when this, the Equality uh, Tribunal was subsumed into, into the WRC, uh, it resulted in what I would see as poor branding, where for those of us within this sector with, who work in equality law, it's very clear to us intuitively what the Workplace Relations Commission does. But for members of the public, those words do not capture the broader discriminatory equality issues that they face. So I think that that really has to be looked at in terms of a, a good communication um, improvement that we could see. 
Given the sensitivity involved in a lot of cases about discrimination that go to the heart of a person's identity, it's positive that there is this less formal, less adversarial and more private tribunal system which can hear cases. But of course, as we've heard, the Zalewski just judgment uh, will change that for some people. And we do think it's important that people should have the right not to, be, not to have their name published uh, if that is a ruling made by the tribunal. And we would also agree that while it's good to have a less formal uh, tribunal system, important constitutional principles about the administration of justice apply. And we hope to see legislation which will allow for the administration of votes at the WRC without any further delay. And finally, as we've heard again from both speakers, access to justice takes money. Hearings before the WRC or the Labour Court do not qualify for civil legal aid as it stands. And even in a less adversarial system, it does raise the question of an equality of arms if the other party, which can be a public or private body, can afford uh, legal representation. And in terms of civil society, uh, I would say that the Commission has really built, built on the legacy of engagement of the previous bodies with civil society. And we recognise that while we have this distinct role to play in advancing human rights and equality, that we are part of that wider ecosystem, which works towards achieving a more just and inclusive society. Civil society organisations like FLAC and many others, they make a vital con contribution to informing and shaping our work as a Commission and to the broader equality landscape. Um, and I believe our grant scheme has aimed to support this among many other goals. So I want to take a bit of a dive now into the public sector duty um, and to talk more a little about that as really what we see as a, a critical uh, forward facing power in this space. So for those who aren't familiar, and I'm sure most of you are, but the public sector duty is a significant development in equality and human rights law. It is a positive statutory obligation on public bodies in the performance of their functions. And it marks a shift from what we see as a pure anti-discrimination focus to a focus on promoting equality of opportunity and equality of outcomes. It means that public bodies don't only take action when a complaint is made against them, but they are proactive in compliance with equality and human rights in a transparent and in an accountable way. There's a couple of things to call out, I suppose, as quite unique to this jurisdiction. So within uh, Europe, its focus on equality and human rights does make our public sector duty um, different, and it gives us scope to look beyond the confines of the equality grounds and look at issues, uh, look at other issues such as, for example, those affecting poverty and, and social exclusion. And the fact that it applies to both public sector staff and service users is a really key strength uh, that we, we wanted to call out as well. Um, and I think it's really important, as I say, to think about this as the future direction of equality legislation in Ireland, which needs to be focused on proactive compliance by public bodies and by private entities uh, with regards to equality and human rights. And really the public sector duty is core to this. It places the burden on the state regarding compliance rather than placing the burden on individuals who might be in vulnerable situations to challenge discrimination and to seek vindication of their own rights. And we heard this um, sentiment echoed in the, in the, in the first seminar uh, of this series, I, I, I thought quite clearly. It, it, the duty speaks to the state's obligations to respect, protect and fulfil equality and human rights for all residents in Ireland. It can be an assistance to public bodies in its adherence to uh, these standards in a systematic way in their daily work. Um, and it provides a motiv motivation for public bodies to really tool up in all levels of the organisation in terms of equality and human rights, because that is essentially what it needs to do uh, to meet the requirements uh, of Section 42. But nonetheless, the, the public sector duty is uh, not without flaws and, and, and we would like to call out, I suppose I'd like to call out a few ways in which it can be strengthened. So one of the things that we are really pushing for is central government ownership and leadership of the duty. And we think that this would really greatly facilitate the implementation. So what we hear back from public bodies uh, is that they see this as a statutory obligation um, to assess, address and report to meet their section 42 requirements. And without that central government uh, input uh, they don't have um, the, the they're, they're not compelled to do so. We also believe that it needs to be stitched into all governance arrangements, procurement, human resources, regulatory oversight, budgetary, and so on, and into the new public sector reform agenda. It also should result in ongoing consultation. 
In time as well, um, there should be a review of section 42 under section 42 uh, subsection 7, um, and that will happen at the right time. Um, and section 2 of the IRAC Act could also potentially be reviewed with a view to extending the definition of a public sector body. So at the moment it is limited, uh, but we would like to see it extended to those in receipt of public funds, which would then incorporate schools, hospitals uh, and nursing homes and so on. So I'm, I'm running up against time, so I just want to make a final few comments around uh, the broader picture of equality legislation um, and some of the, the policy imperatives around it. Um, so obviously we are at this milestone, uh, this 20 year milestone, and we've seen the evolution of uh, both the laws and the case law alongside it. Um, uh, Eilish mentioned the most recent um, NDA um, bill going through the channel at the moment, and we've obviously seen a plethora of other amendments to the acts um, over the last 20 years. Um, and this parallel development of case law stemming mostly from the W or C. Um, the, the, the equality architecture obviously has evolved in that time as well, and that includes our own establishment and powers and the development of our powers. Um, but we do see uh, challenges going forward, and I really want to hammer home this point that I've mentioned already, that what we need to be working towards is this model which seeks to identify, mitigate and respond to equality issues before they arise and before that damage is done. So one of the examples that I would cite is the, the recent uh, asylum seeker uh, case looking for a driver's license. The WRC in that case found that uh, it had, the rejection had amounted to discrimination, awarded the 5,000 compensation, uh, but then at the High Court that was overturned. Um, and the result is that uh, the, the individual in this case still does not have um, that uh, driver's license. So I'm just going to list off just very quickly some of the other areas where we would like to see um, uh, some changes. The Intoxicating Liquor Act, which has obviously uh, been treated within the district court, bringing huge limitations. Also around intersectionality of complaints. Um, so obviously complaints can be referred on several grounds and found on several grounds, but unfortunately that cap of 15,000 still applies and that needs to be uh, addressed. Um, and that may take uh, some specific legislative um, provisions to address that. Um, so if we're looking ahead to those to the next 20 years, if you like, um, I think it's important to encourage government to consider not just the grounds and, and uh, the, the, the seminar last week obviously touched on this in, in depth, but really to look at the broader picture of uh, the equality legislation and how effective it's been. So strengthening those specific grounds, absolutely. Um, and, and we have uh, established our position on the socioeconomic um, ground as well as gender identity, um, but also around access to redress, a comprehensive and resourced system of legal aid, looking at that intersectional piece um, and also engaging with inequality and discrimination in digital spheres. We need to look at hate speech, the digital divide, AI um, and automated decision making and so on. So I've kind of run out of time and I haven't really got to the policy piece, but I know uh, Neil did a very good job of, of, of touching on that anyway. And I'd be happy to answer any further questions on it um, in, in, the, in the question section. But for now, I'll hand back over to Eilish and thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to both of you. That, that was really interesting. We have a number of questions that are coming in and I suppose to a certain extent some of you have dealt with some of the questions but um, there's a question thanking you both for your excellent and insightful presentations um, and given the challenges in enforcement is in this area, are there any additional enforcement tools or powers that could serve as useful? Sinead? Um, well, I think the, um, I mean, I touched on, I suppose I went to, wanted to go into detail on just one, which was the, the, the public sector duty, but I do think the other enforcement powers of uh, our own enforcement powers, uh, you know, can be built upon. I mean, we're, we're seven years old as an organization uh, and, and have it carrying that 20 year legacy, but I do think um, it's taken a little time to just get our heads around the legislation and the implementation of these powers. Uh, but I'm excited about the area of enforcement under my term. That's certainly an area that I want to see us progress and that's enforcement in within the public sector duty space specifically uh, but also building on the equality reviews codes of practice the equality action plans and so on uh, because I do believe it exactly as I've said takes us away from that uh, that space where where the individual obligation is is prior is primary into um, a, a, a space where we're dealing with things as they arise. Thanks Sinead and um, Neil can I just ask you about the research you quoted which talked about 
having a critical mass of cases and the necessity to have a critical mass of cases. And I'm just curious, is there any country that is actually doing that? Is there any specialized equality body across Europe that is doing that? Because I remember from working in the Equality Authority that it was very hard to establish a critical mass of cases that went across all of the grounds and that there was a huge demand for uh, representation, particularly say on the gender ground in pregnancy discrimination or maternity rights cases. And we could easily have used up all our resources to that to, to uh, do them. And I believe with the current COVID crisis, I'm sure today, there would be equally uh, an equivalent amount of demand for representation in equality cases on the gender ground. And then on the equal status side, we were absolutely uh, snowed under with requests for representation in terms of access to discrimination or discrimination claims in terms of access to licensed premises. So I'm just interested, does the, does the research or the standards throw up any light on what constitutes a critical mass of cases? And then how do you make sure that all of the grounds receive appropriate uh, attention? Um, thanks, Eilish. Um, the, the critical mass reference is in the Council of Europe standards, uh, and it's not clarified, all right? It's, it's in a wider definition of, of strategic litigation and what strategic litigation should, should encompass, all right? But I think it did capture from uh, my knowledge of the debates at the time, a concern at dropping rates of, of, of litigation across uh, equality bodies and, and, and uh, you know, across Europe at, at the time for, ver for, ver for various reasons, sometimes resources, sometimes lack of powers, sometimes strategy, and I suppose I'd, I'd challenge that one. Uh, and then sometimes pressure that, that at the time there were, there were bodies that had taken significant levels of casework but suddenly found themselves in difficulties with the with the national authorities. France being one one example in in, in that that regard. So th th that's the issue. I, I think yeah, we could do further work on what do we mean by critical mass. Uh, we, we 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 certainly know it means more. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, and I think Sinead's commitment to litigation is is really positive to hear in that regard, and 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 and, and very I think very very important. Um, but. But I think, yeah, we do need to dig into it. I do remember in the past, we dug into particular barriers facing grounds, like the, the sexual orientation ground was, was particularly difficult for people to come forward under and, and looked at ways of mitigating those, those barriers. All right. but, but yeah, I think it's a bit like multi-mandate bodies. Uh, it's a theme that merits further debate. It's a team that mer merits a bit of invention and it's a theme that merits uh, ongoing dialogue in its own right, critical mass, yeah. Okay, thanks, Neil. Um, Sinead, uh, one of the questions asked, what are the biggest challenges post-COVID facing uh, IREC? And I know we in FLAC have been absolutely overwhelmed on our telephone information line with uh, requests for basic legal information and advice. So I'm just curious uh, what, what the challenges ye have faced as a result of COVID. And Neil, has there been research or guidance across Europe on responding on equality bodies responding to COVID? Start yeah, I mean, I, I think um, the uh, what we face as an organization, like any other organization from an operational perspective, obviously it's been very challenging and particularly with a lot of new staff um, starting dur during this period. In terms of our work and how we've engaged on it, um, I mean, we've obviously kept a monitor on the um, civil, li civil liberties implication of the emergency powers. And that's uh, something we're actually back in the Oireachtas on Tuesday uh, to provide evidence on that. Um, and it has been problematic. There's been a blurring of lines in state powers, but it also exposed uh, the, um, the lack of scrutiny, the lack of equality in human rights oversight of lawmaking within the state. Um, so I would see it as an opportunity. I mean, I think what happened, you know, really brought to light a lot of the issues that we probably know and are familiar with, but brought that to the attention of a much more mainstream and, and wider audience. So I think we have to, to, to use that and capitalise on it. I mean, I think the other thing that would come to mind immediately is really the uh, the, the, the 
accommodation settings that so many people find themselves in and that really stretches into congregated settings institutional care direct provision and places where people were simply unable to deal with uh, the public health measures that had been introduced um, and that has proved so problematic uh, in so many instances obviously so those are some of the the, the key things that we would have seen come through at European level, Equinet, the European Network of Equality Bodies, have tracked the work of equality bodies uh, across the European Union in relation to COVID-19 and has produced a report in some of the learning from that work. Um, and it showed, I think, a huge amount of effort in dealing with some of the issues that Sinead raises, I think, in terms of, of the impact of the management of, of, of the pandemic on particular groups covered by the legislation and, and the fact that that impact was um, particularly difficult, I suppose but also the, the inequalities that it exposed uh, and, and the particular barriers that it, it, it put in their, in, their, in their way. One of the big issues came up was where there is a public sector duty that it was not being implemented uh, in, in the COVID response and, and that there was a significant failure in that regard. If it was being implemented, it was being implemented after the effect in, in a way when, when it would have been much more valuable to do it at the time of, of preparing it. So that, mindset of a public sector duty hasn't stuck anywhere yet and certainly hasn't stuck here 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 in Ireland and then it, it has shifted the agenda a bit I think health is and health services are much more on the agenda of equality bodies certainly the areas that Sinead referenced in terms of accommodation um, much more on the agenda the care infrastructure and the model of care uh, on the agenda and then another one I'd add was the whole area of digital inequality and the move of public services online and the inequalities that that has exposed uh, and how they, they might need to be addressed. So I think what it's done is it's shifted agendas for, for equality bodies across Europe. But I agree, it's, it's absolutely opened up opportunities as well, you know, in terms of a society committed to solidarity, care and inter, in, interdependence in responding to a pandemic is a society that should be concerned with equality. And that's a wave that equality bodies should be riding on at the, at the current moment in terms of policy and provision. Thanks, Neil. Today, do you want to add to that? Well, I mean, I, I don't think I've, I've anything to add except exactly that sentiment. We need to capitalise on this. We need to, to build on it. Um, but I do have a question for both of you, actually, if I may sneak one in with two minutes to go. I was just curious to hear your reflections, given the recent uh, uh, decision by uh, the Port Marnock Golf Club to uh, change its policy. It must have been an emotional moment for you both. I don't know how much you'd like to say on it, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. <laughs> I'll leave that to you, Neil. <laughs> Not sure my thoughts are <laughs> Play in the public forum. <laughs> well, I, I suppose it, it's shocking how slowly change comes, you know, and, and, and such a fundamental yeah. uh, statement of discrimination and statement of inequality from such an institution uh, in, in society that it should have struggled on and held on to that position for over 20 years is, is truly yeah. extraordinary in, in that way. Um, I, I think it raised issues in terms of the courts and the role of the courts uh, in, in, in enforcing the Equal, the Equal Status Act. Um, but above all, it, it, it's, it's a message of the urgency of work on equality issues. You know, we, we cannot take that long to change something so basic as, as, as that and when there's so much else to be done. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we just, my, my final question, I suppose, what we're hoping that will come out of the committed, the commitment to, re, to review the Equal Status Act, in, at least in terms of the socioeconomic ground, is a proper review of the Equal Status legislation. And could you both just end with saying, what are the most important things that should be in, included in future legislation to promote and protect equality? Uh, Neil, I'll start with you and let Sinead finish. Thanks, Eilish. <laughs> um, I love these. I love these seminars where you're warned about the questions you're going to be asked. <laughs> um, okay, I, I think the, the, in reinforcing the equal status legislation, I, I would take the opportunity to to um, focus in on the public sector duty as well. At the same time, I, I, I would strengthen enforcement of the public sector duty. I would extend the public sector duty into the private sector as, as, as well. Uh, I like Sinead's mention of that. I think that would be really important. In terms of the equal status legislation, I, I would uh, improve the sanctions. The sanctions are not dissuasive. They're in breach of the directives, I believe, in that regard. I would also remove the exemption in terms of anything that can be done under, anything that is done under existing legislation is not deemed to be discriminatory. That just 
almost absolves the public sector from, from, from the, the provisions and, and that absolutely must go this time. And, and finally, I would introduce the socioeconomic status ground. And I think that's a real gain from the integration of equality and human rights, the, the emergence of debate on that ground. It, it needs to be included now in the equality legislation. Sinead? Yeah, I, I mean, I won't repeat um, uh, what, what Neil has called out, except the last one, the, the socioeconomic ground, I think. And, and also just to look at other ones as well. I mean, we're seeing in other jurisdictions the consideration of other grounds, such as I was looking at the, the Crown Act in, in California, for example, where racial discrimination is now um, looking at um, physical features as, as a manifestation of that discrimination and how that can be legislated for. Um, so really kind of looking at the, the contemporary picture of discrimination and how the grounds can encompass it. But again, just making sure that the government doesn't just fall into that trap of looking at the grounds themselves, but also about the effectiveness of the law more generally. So I do think that cumulative uh, intersectional um, issue needs to be dealt with. It needs to be, uh, 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 people need to be able to deal with multiple um, pieces. I mean, just to go into a little bit more detail because I rushed through it at the end there but I do think we also have to engage with um, inequality and discrimination in the digital sphere so uh, there's legislation at the moment obviously looking at hate speech and hate crime um, but also then the digital divide needs to be looked at which Neil just mentioned has been so critically exposed uh, during the last year um, but also we saw last year with the leaving cert our first taste of what uh, AI can look like uh, when it when it discriminates and that is going to be a feature so algorithms machine learning automated decision making have to be catered for within the next generation of legislation um, issues to goods and services digitally so education you know has been available over the COVID period online but working will be more remotely facilitated and how does that play out in terms of uh, uh, discrimination and the positive duties on private organizations, absolutely. And data, we really need to critically strengthen our data so that we can measure what we can't measure, we can't change. And I think that all needs to be looked at. And I would welcome, uh, as Neil references, that this is more broadly looked at all of the different pieces of legislation where we see this, including the IREC Act, uh, our, our own act. So I think um, that more wholesome picture, absolutely, let's, uh, let's take a look at all of it. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you both. That was really enjoyable and uh, a very thorough discussion, I think, on the challenges facing us. Um, I also want to give a big thank you to the very impressive Michael Feeney, who's been uh, engaged in sign language interpretation all along, and to the FLAC team, Chris Bose, Susan Dennehy and Caroline Smith, and our colleagues in uh, Trinity, especially Sean and IT, who's made this all happen. The final session is on next Tuesday. We have a great lineup with Professors Sandra Fredman and Mark Bell, considering the future of, of equality, and Minister Roderick O'Gormo will provide the closing address. So thank you so much, and thank you again, Sinead and Neil, and hopefully we'll see you all again next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eilish. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.